So on behalf of Otis College of Art and Design, I would like to welcome you to the release of the 2018 Otis Report on the Creative Economy. I'm Bruce W. Ferguson, the proud president of this college, and I want to thank you for joining us here at Otis College of Art and Design and online. This is the first time we've held this event on our campus, and we're thrilled to be doing so, and we're very happy that you've joined us today. <clears throat> As you might have heard, uh, last week, the County of Los Angeles Board of Supervisors voted to create a new department for the arts. And in doing so, they cited the 2017 Otis Report on the Creative Economy as a part of their case for the change. This report continues to show with hard statistics that the creative spectrum is both central to LA and California and a growth sector. We hope the Otis Report will continue to inspire uh, public policy conversations and actions that acknowledge and support the power of the creative economy. We know that this report has had influence in other places as well, uh, more closely in uh, Culver City and at a great distance in Nairobi, which uh, is both surprising and wonderful. Uh, this morning, Samjita Mitra, director of the Institute for Applied Economics at the Los Angeles County Economic Development Corporation, will provide an overview of the 2018 report. And then Sean Johnson, Vice President of Experience Design and Innovation for NBC Universal, will share his thoughts on the changing creative economy. After Sean's remarks, we'll take questions from the audience. I would like to express our thanks to the Institute for Applied Economics at the Los Angeles County Economic Development Corporation for generating the data and authoring the report. Its creation would also not have been possible without the generous support of individuals and organizations that have joined together to affirm the value of the creative economy. I would like to especially thank our sponsors for their support, the California Arts Council, um, has been an invaluable partner on this project, providing lead sponsorship of the report and exclusive sponsorship of the addendum. Additional support was provided by the City of Los Angeles Department of Cultural Affairs, City National Bank, Marsh, Mattel, and Moss Adams. We'd also like to thank our media partners, Arts Orange County and Californians for the Arts. Please welcome and uh, join me in welcoming Samjita Mitra. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It is my great pleasure to present some of the key findings from our 2018 report on the creative economy. Now, I'm going to be talking about a lot of numbers, so I hope you've had enough coffee. <laughs> Edward de Bono said, there is no doubt that creativity is the most important human resource of all. Without it, there would be no progress. The creative industries makes a significant contribution to employment and economic growth in California. They also foster innovation and encourage spillover effects that create opportunities in other industries. The state's creative industries help move the economy forward by attracting investment, tourism, and consumer spending, and by generating significant tax revenues. Activities based on creativity and culture are essential components of a robust, healthy, and growing economy. As Bruce mentioned just last week, the Board of Supervisors had voted to change the Arts Commission into a fully functioning arts department to further elevate the impact of arts on our community, our culture, and our economy. So just to really briefly, these are the industries that we use to define the creative economy. Now the industry listings can vary depending on the purpose of the research and the research themselves, but in general this is the most cited and comprehensive cluster. First, the creative economy is composed of the businesses and individuals that are involved in producing the artistic, cultural, and design goods and services. It also includes the organizations that provide a venue for the artists to share their work with the public, including museums, art galleries, and theaters. Finally, the creative economy includes the support system that teaches, nurtures, and sustains creative economy, including arts programs in schools, 
post-secondary art institutions that develop our talent and the philanthropic foundations that support the arts. So just what is the size of the creative economy in California? The creative economy contributes over $400 billion to our state's GDP with a labor income of almost $142 billion and tax revenues of over $16 billion and supports 1.6 million jobs in direct, indirect, and induced jobs. The direct jobs alone have over, um, surpassed the Great Recession, after which we had lost almost 200,000 jobs by 2011 when we reached uh, 571,000. Since then, we've recovered all our jobs and we're continuing to project healthy growth over the next five years and we anticipate that we're going to reach about 834,000 jobs by 2021. These direct jobs will in turn support jobs in the community through indirect and induced impacts. The creative economy in California is significant. It's 789,000 um, direct jobs. The next highest is New York with 477,000 jobs. So we are a significant component of our um, economy is the creative economy. California, or Los Angeles, almost 9% of our jobs can be attributed to those who work in the creative industry, which is far uh, higher than the other percentages in other creative clusters such as Seattle, New York, and the Bay Area. So this looks at the distribution of uh, jobs in the creative economy by industry. Almost two-thirds of the jobs are in publishing and printing, entertainment, and fashion. Up to this point, I talked only about the creative industry employment. However, there's creative occupations uh, that cover everybody in all other industries. One way to consider the creative economy is to look at what people are actually doing in the creative occupations. People in creative occupations can be found throughout the economy and not just in our defined set of creative industries. And the one thing we want to look at is how much higher people in the creative occupations get paid com uh, compared to the California average of $40,976. And this makes sense considering that 50% of employment in the creative occupations require a bachelor's degree or higher. So I hope I've whetted your appetite regarding the imp importance of the creative economy to our economic health and vitality. Thank you so much. Thank you, Samjita. <clears throat> it's now my great pleasure to introduce Sean Johnson, who will share his thoughts on the thriving creative economy and what he sees from his unique vantage point. Uh, Sean is Vice President of Experience Design and Innovation for NBC Universal, where he leads an Emmy award-winning team to develop innovative and multi-platform apps, products, and experiences for some of the biggest shows on television today. Responsible for the design and creative vision, Sean champions human-centered experience strategies for the network's products, platforms, services, and channels. Prior to NBC, he served as senior UX lead and creative director for Microsoft, championing, championing the path towards a unified consumer brand experience, working across the entire Microsoft ecosystem. His team led business groups, partners, towards a unified global brand experience. Please welcome me in joining one of our own from Otis College class of 1994, Sean Johnson. Hi. Uh, as I was talking to Bruce earlier, I'm, I'm a little... I'm going to get it out of the way. I'm more nervous on this than any other speech I've ever done because this is, uh, of course, my alma mater. Uh, a fantastic new space, by the way. Uh, catch me afterwards and we'll talk through what downtown used to look like. So with that, I'll, I'll, I'll get started. Good morning and welcome. First of all, I'd like to thank um, the LAC, uh, Otis, Jeffrey Perkins, and of course Bruce Ferguson for inviting me to speak today and share some of my perspectives about the future of design uh, that coincides with the release of the 10th annual uh, Otis Report on the Creative Economy. Uh, I'm honored to be uh, amongst such an amazing group of people and the first alumni to deliver the remarks at the new campus, uh, which by the way, for those who are live streaming, you should really come here and visit. Uh, I'm hopeful that my words will inspire the curious 
empower the bold, and set a precedent for our shared and future opportunities. So who is this guy? Who am I? Um, so I'm going to give you a little bit of background on, on where I came from and how I got uh, here and my path through Otis. So I grew up on the central coast of California in a place called Santa Maria. It's, uh, now it's known for its amazing wineries and rolling hills and all of that, but it wasn't quite the story when I was young and I grew up there. Uh, it was a mixture between agriculture, retirees, and people like my father who worked at Vandenberg Air Force Base. So like most kids, I love to draw, paint, and play with my dad's Polaroid cameras and Super 8 cameras. But also, like most kids, as I grew older, creativity was actually taught out of me. Um, I was taught to sit still. I was taught to be right, not wrong. Uh, I was taught to stay within the curriculum. And as time went on, I would create less and less, less drawing, less painting, and fewer films. So therefore, I directed my focus towards mathematics, English, and political science with the hopes of going into an engineering or scientific field. Um, however, in my junior year in high school, the most fortunate of unfortunate events happened. I actually got knocked out uh, and suffered a concussion and amnesia uh, by playing football. So following my injury, I struggled with mathematics and was actually forced to rethink not just my path, but my focus and my purpose. Um, but during that time, in a brief stint in San Diego State, I rediscovered uh, the amazing world that was inside of me around arts and creativity. Um, I was fascinated with design. I found a newfound energy and focus and a new way of thinking. So ultimately, that brought me to Otis in the 90s, um, where it unlocked, uh, where it basically was located downtown next to MacArthur Park. It was gritty, energetic, and unapologetic. It was contrasted by palm trees and skyscrapers. The campus was exposed us to an amazing, in the 90s, an amazing cultural rebirth in arts, fashion, and the design scenes in Los Angeles. Otis gave me a voice. It gave me a safe environment to explore new ideas and a creative outlet that both challenged me and elevated my thinking. Otis provided me with a framework to look at problems holistically through the lens of many different and diverse perspectives. And since those days downtown, I've actually continued to apply those same practices and principles throughout my life and career. I've passed them on to my clients. I've passed them on to my students. I've passed them on to my colleagues and even my own children. So that takes me to today, my current role at NBC. Uh, and I oversee the experience design for our products, platforms, services, digital channels, and customer experience. What that means when you kind of drill down into that is we design all the applications, uh, creative, and stories that engage and entertain people. We create the content that powers billions and billions of monthly impressions and interactions. And we develop future experiences using new technologies like voice UI and conversational UX, augmented reality, and connected experiences. Ultimately, our goal at the core and my goal is to bring people together in shared moments that build lasting memories. So another key area that we, that we focus on at NBC and part of my role is with technology. And as the technology tools are growing and continue to grow, it actually increases our ability to enable and expand our creativity as designers and creative thinkers. Uh, my teams use technology as an advantage uh, to think through the design process and look at new ways of thinking in new applications that we can uh, impact and delight people. So what that means is more ideas and more opportunities. It means more failures, which is a hard word for many people to stomach, but more failures actually produce more successes. And more diversity in the way that we think and the way that we build these experiences um, creates greater empathy and understanding. So applying design thinking practices actually allows us to solve more meaningful human challenges for today and into the future. The opportunity for everyone in this room, my children and your children, will continue to find new ways to expand the creative economy in California. So what does that look like? Today's flourishing creatives. Whether you consider yourself a traditional or non-traditional creative, it's a great time for creative makers, thinkers to thrive. 
Over the past decade, we've seen a steady growth and maturity of people in the creative and design fields. And this has opened up new opportunities for creatives to explore innovative products and experiences. I also have an Edward de Bono quote, uh, which is one which is great that we saw that. Uh, creativity involves breaking out of established patterns in order to look at things in a different way. I think this is really at the core of how we think and what we do. And you'll see in a, in a upcoming slide the, the idea of multilateral thinking. So Edward de Bono really coined that phrase. And it's a way of looking at different perspectives and laterally, not just in a singular sort of dedicated path. So over the past two decades, um, for me, it's been incredible to be part of the evolution and rapid growth of design and creativity in Los Angeles and throughout California. So from Silicon Valley to Silicon Beach, San Francisco to San Diego, and all points north, south, east, and west. Um, however, with all the technology advancements over the past decade, the next 10 years, I believe, are poised to spawn a true renaissance of creativity, accelerated ideas, uh, and leave a transformative impact on our world today. So how has technology actually impacted us over the past decade? More people are connected in more complex ways through digital devices. I, in fact, had to go run and get my two phones back out of my car. I have two phones. Um, there's more of an abundance of tools that actually help us as creators, as creative people, to actually create better, stronger, faster. Uh, and really evolve our thinking in new ways. And there's new challenges that obviously emerge with new technologies that designers and creative people at their core, and I think in their core DNA, are driven to solve. Um, what was I going to say? Uh, Albert Einstein actually, uh, a great quote that I, that I really like and I think is pointed for today as well is, is it's one, one of the things, things when we look, look at, at technology, as Albert Einstein said, uh, it's, it's become appallingly obvious that our technology has exceeded our humanity. Now, that, that was, was a reference to the atomic bomb uh, back, back in those days, but I actually believe that that's more so relevant today in how we use technology and how we use that and measure that from a creative aspect and how we connect with people. So that brings me to multilateral thinking, which is, I think, one of the core sort of emerging areas that you're really going to start to see and you're going to hear a lot more about. And multilateral thinking is really about solving problems through an indirect creative approach. So it allows us to look at a problem in a nonlinear fashion and look at it from a different perspective. It allows us to actually take a step back and instead of asking why, we ask why not, or to ask what if. Um, to, to really, really change, change our approach. And so, so that, that sort of thinking and shifting allows us to think, at a prob uh, think of through a problem in a new and different way. Perspective, Perspective shifting is also something that increases both creative and empathy. Uh, looking, looking at a problem through the eyes of another is, is going to shift, shift your thinking in a much different way. way. Changing your environment will also allow a creative shift in the way that you look at things. So different locations, we're no longer narrow focused, we're a global sort of approach on how we live as humans. So asking why uh, actually helps us to get to the emotional root of what people are looking for. And when we're designing or as we're creative and as we're building new sort of innovative ideas and, and creations, asking that why and getting at the core of what's really the inherent value for people is incredibly important. And I think with that, Look, creative people are naturally positioned to view, view things differently. We're always a little bit off, frankly. We look at things in a different way. But I think that gives us a, a, a huge leg up and a benefit. Um, you know, and Otis is a perfect example of how that, how that culture sort of builds and looking at those diverse perspectives. So we always take a different approach. Um, we sometimes walk away or walk somewhere to inspire us, which is really uncommon, I think, in traditional models. And um, we, we tend, tend to seek out counter positions that actually challenge our theories. I mean, imagine that, to actually look and challenge somebody else and have a diverse perspective that might not be my own might actually open me up to something new and interesting. So in many ways, creative thinkers, I believe, have always been design thinkers. And with that, creative thinking and the value of craft is actually in our core DNA as creatives and as designers. Now more than ever, we see designers leading a new type of thinking, developing new products, new experiences, and new business models. With the rising importance of creativity and design, there's a greater focus towards craft. 
uh, through, through an, an infinite, infinite and iterative, iterative process. process. And within that process, we've kind of, IBM, as well as many of us within the field, uh, define that as a loop, which means that you're constantly sort of iterating and improving what you're doing. You're constantly learning and thinking through it. And that really breaks down into five sort of core elements within that loop. One is empathy, to empathize, to understand your user, your customer, your consumer, your person. Uh, two is to define that, to hone in on their core drivers and needs, to really understand what drives them, what's purposeful for them, what has value within their everyday lives. Then from there, you ideate, right? You create multiple sort of ideas, you brainstorm, you come up with the craziest notion, uh, and you look at those concepts in a, in a very unified way with a diverse group of people. Then you drill that down, you prototype those. And that doesn't matter what industry you're in. Prototyping is really the key of discovery and really understanding and measuring. And out of prototypes becomes testing, which could be as simple as asking opinions of others that you respect, or actually putting a physical prototype out in the world and seeing how people really react to that. So at, you know, this process, as it continues, you see context and form are on the two ends. And craft is really that sweet spot in the middle that you know, you know continuous, continuous sort of refinement really builds that craft and that expertise. So, so what's the role of design, design in our future? Design, design thinking, thinking methods have recently taken more transformative roles in shaping businesses, innovation, and even how we solve global challenges. Uh, Tim Brown is uh, both the CEO and president of IDEO. And I'm sure many of you guys know about IDEO, and they, they really started to mature and coin uh, the design thinking process and helped to found the Stanford D School um, that really looks at these challenges in a new and interesting way. The really, the, the key takeaway with, with that sort of champion of inclusivity with design, design thinking is, is really at the core is design cannot and should not divide or dictate. At its core, it must bring people together throughout the process. And that's really at the core of what design and creativity, I think, has to offer. Designers and creative visionaries aren't new, um, but they're rare in leadership roles today. But we see that changing. In the past decade, designers and creative visionaries have led some of the most successful companies in the world. And each one of these up here at their core is driven by design, is thought through with creativity, and those business models continue to excel. And design-focused organizations are reshaping 100-year-old brands into new competitive models through meaningful customer experiences. IBM is a perfect example of that. We're in the old IBM building, and they are in a renaissance of design-focused and creativity for the next century. Um, it's amazing what they're doing there. And I will throw a few numbers out there because we found these. So over the past decade, design-led companies have outperformed other companies on the S&P by over 200% year over year. I expect that to increase as we see more designers and creative leaders coming into organizations, helping to solve problems in unique ways. Expect that number to go up. That is an awesome number to put out there. And you say, well, how is that possible? Going back to IBM, Thomas Watson, was correct when he said, good design is good business. That was a quote from him in 1973, nearly 50 years ago. And today that same company is again going through a renaissance in design and creativity, transforming their company for the next century, for the future. Why is that? IBM and most mature design organizations have instituted a set of unified design thinking principles. And at the core, there are Three. There we go. Should really act as no surprise. Um, diverse and inclusive thinking. Solving problems for people requires an approach that needs to actually include people. Including different perspectives from both your teams, your customers, your colleagues is actually just good business. Diversity is good business. And diversity in thinking actually drives new perspectives throughout the design process. Human-centered design is what we do at MVC at it, its core, and many design organizations are moving towards that, putting the human, putting the customer first. So when we design for people, we discover new opportunities and new outcomes throughout that process. 
when we look at the journey, we understand how products actually fit within people's lives. We don't make stuff because we want to do it, or for a core business driver, business has its value and we have to produce value. But value without meaning for our customers means nothing. And that's the new ecosystem where I think creativity will rise. And we put ourselves in other people's shoes. We actually we push ourselves to do design research, uh, ethnographic studies, to really understand people's pain points, their emotions, their delights, and how we can benefit, even with entertainment, in a way that's unique throughout their days and their life cycles. And then, of course, we design with empathy. Empathy is at its core around design and design thinking. Uh, designing with emotional understanding of someone's daily habits and routines provides us with uh, holistic insights and an approach to, to really figure out what's most important for them. Where's the value is us as a company for them, not them as a value to us. And so as our lives become more complicated and reliant on technologies, I believe that designers' roles will actually increase not just in relevancy, but in, in, as importance throughout the world. And that starts my next sort of transition on the, import, and the importance of arts in STEAM programs and how we really look at providing that framework, going back to the fact that most, most of us were taught out of being creative. There's a resurgence with STEAM to actually reteach that thinking to five-year-olds, two-year-olds, eight-year-olds, ten-year-olds, and reinvest in that culture. So the, including, the inclusion of arts and design in tra traditional STEM programs is, began about a decade ago or so. Uh, John Mido is, is somebody that I, I'm not necessarily direct friends with, but somebody that I respect uh, holistically, and actually went to Congress to push this through. Um, it wasn't until recently that we've really started to see these STEAM programs gain more traction. And that's really the maturity and the value that we're seeing in educational environments. So in tr introducing creative thinking into traditional STEM programs, which of course science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, really that A, the arts and design, uh, really provides that, that lateral thinking, that diverse perspective, that creative thinking that allows our children to be iterative, innovative, use the lateral thinking framework, and actually produce empathy around what they're doing. I'll throw up another quote, Pablo Picasso. I think that kind of reads itself. Um, I think many of us feel that we were taught out of this. But I think when you start to look at the new generations that are out there, the tools that they have available to them, the creativity that they're empowered with, and just the unabashed carelessness of just saying they don't look at what, what they can't do, they look at what they can do. And I think moving towards this highlights the core stigmas around our society and educational institutions around creativity and creative expression. I think we are moving away from getting um, those stigmas. So just shameless um, excitement around this. I have two boys, an uh, eight-year-old and 13-year-old. Um, in talking, talking about, about STEAM, STEAM, these are these several of the, the uh, products, products and technologies that we've actually been using with them um, since they were really young. Both, Both of my boys actually code, uh, started coding and creating around the age of four and five. Um, and so, you know, my wife and I, we walk the walk. Both of my boys are in STEAM programming right now with LAUSD, um, public programs that are pilots. Um, but this kind of gives you a platform that's already out there. Nintendo Labo is brand new for all those folks who love the Switch. It's amazing. It's a maker sort of environment. Um, and allows them to actually make and create and use the technology to advance what they're doing. Hopscotch, my now eight-year-old, is what he actually learned how to code on, uh, which is a drag and drop sort of sprites for kids to learn storytelling and coding and creativity. Cano allows kids to not only build their own computer, uh, but create uh, iterations of that, put that into closed forums that are safe for them, and to communicate with others and share code. And then Minecraft, I think everybody has probably heard enough about, uh, and Lego should have really bought them earlier, but Lego Robotics is also awesome. Minecraft is just amazing. The more that I watch my boys play with that and how they're building, how they're thinking, how they're intersecting spatial environments, that is the basics of what they need to understand from architecture. And then, of course, MIT Scratch, which is an amazing framework and a community environment um, fostered by MIT. 
So, so that, that just gives, gives you guys, guys, I think, a little bit of, of these, these aren't going away. away. These are growing. It's a huge market now to really invest in children at a young age to explore their creativity, their thinking in new and interesting ways. So again, leaning on the importance of arts and STEAM, teaching earlier and continuously, when the arts are integrated into curriculum early and continuously, uh, our creative curiosity continues to, continues to naturally grow and mature with us. We have yet to see, I think, the true impact of STEAM programs out there in the world, and new generations are no longer bound by traditional limitations or technologies. New generations equal new thinking. I've witnessed this firsthand with my boys, they benefit from these programs. Um, however, it should be no surprise again that we've implemented these early and often with our boys and they are doing music, they are creating, they're doing drawing, storytelling. Uh, we have used these as, as intimate teaching tools to accelerate their learning. They're both tested highly gifted. And then arts and design, I believe, will transform future businesses. So obviously in today's uh, economy, leaders are looking for ways to produce extraordinary results, generally with limited resources and budgets. Um, and as a result, I think design thinking and creative learning opportunities have, have gained a lot more popularity in larger organizations who are looking to innovate and transform their culture. So again, you can start to see the threads of how creativity and design sort of are starting to emerge in larger corporations and organizations. Ambiguity, improvisation is fostering inspiration and innovation and lateral and perspective shifting. Exploring artistic metaphors and art history and really looking at new design in a whole is understanding the different perspective shiftings of different individuals. Not everybody sees the same thing in a piece of art. And that's being used as a tool to understand the diversity of thought. And then music. Music is actually being used uh, in ways where we have to actively listen. So that's being that's being used as a tool to help um, leadership actually translate and use active listening in their organizations because you have to sit down, you have to understand, you hear different notes. So all of these things, and there's patterns in there as well. All of these things, I think, come from the core of who we are uh, as creatives and designers, and you're seeing that really flourish now out there in the world. And that brings me to a brighter future together. Um, people always ask me, you know, what, what do I think the future holds? Um, especially in these times of uncertainty. Uh, what's my perspective and how do I stay inspired? I will be honest, it's challenging. Um, the world is moving incredibly fast. Uh, the political and global environment is an impact, but I think that it's an area um, that I think creatives have a lot to offer in. And then you get into, imagine, you know, how Artificial intelligence, voice assistance, machine learning, uh, robotics, automation. How will those share the space that we live in creatively and with the arts? And, and we look at those usually as, as something that's actually going to take things away from us. I don't look at them that way. I think they're actually a benefit. They're just a set of tools. And when you put creatives and empower them with those types of tools, they can do amazing and meaningful things. I promise. I've only got a couple more quotes that flow in, but I think you guys have noticed I like quotes. This is one of my favorites, and I actually shared this with my boys who are, are mixed race as well, by the way, um, and a lot of young creatives, because I think that, that even out of the direct context of where this quote came from, I think it's very powerful. Every great dream begins with a dreamer. Always remember, you have within you the strength, the patience, and the passion to reach for the stars and change the world. And I think that's at the core that we have to continue to instill with people, and not just people in creative fields, but people in general. There is that power, and I think that design and creativity can help to, to recognize that future. So when we look across the landscape of the entire creative economy, when we recognize that there's abundance of new opportunities that we realize we haven't yet dreamed, uh, we will inspire and innovate through storytelling. We can inspire through our imagination and combined with empathy, remains one of our greatest offerings as designers and creative people to the world. So one thing I know that's out there is the next generations, as I touched on, will, will truly inspire us. There are so many new technologies um, that are emerging. 
These are emerging and being thought of by creative people. These aren't just engineers. They're not just business people. They are holistically done uh, and created uh, by people who think differently and think collaboratively and diversely. So again, AI, machine learning, voice assistance and voice UI, and automation. Um, I think the most interesting thing to me in looking at a lot of different segments of how creative people have evolved from my generation to the 20-somethings to the 30-somethings, right? They bring a unique social perspective and empathy around the world. Um, centennial generations, which is the one that follows, are natural coders. They're natural makers and inventors. They have these tools available to them, and they are embracing them. And I think the future generations that are just being born and just coming in will be born into this world. And that might sound scary. But the reality is, is I believe that those children, those kids, will find new and interesting ways to make this creative. You know, I have, uh, we have Google Home and Alexa throughout the house, and watching my boys play with that and talk to it and converse with that is incredibly inspiring. It's aggravating for me. She doesn't respond as well as I want her to, but it's really, really amazing to watch how they, how they use it and how they talk to her. And notice I called it her. Um, so look, in the end, I, I believe that design will actually connect us all. Creative people are constantly inventing, constantly evolving, and constantly inspiring new ways of thinking. We are the true rebels. And because of that responsibility, I believe that we sh should remain powerful champions to build a brighter, more meaningful, and more interesting future together. Whether it was Henry Ford with the Model T, you got Elon Musk with the Model X, and a group and a team called Terrafugia is currently developing the first autonomous flying and driving car. That is the next 10 years. So for me, in closing, look, creativity and design have always been about engaging people and bringing people together through passionate expressions and diverse voices, especially, I believe, for those who feel that they have no voice, that they have no visibility, or they have no platform. I think it's our purpose to be able to provide that. It was over 65 years ago when Charles Eames originally spoke about the quality of our connections being the key to the quality of our designs. And it is my sincere belief that we are all connected and eventually everyone and everything will be connected in ways that we have yet to think up or dream. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Sean. Um, we're we're going to come on stage, the three of us, and answer questions in a more visible way, perhaps, than we were doing in the past. Uh, um. I should that button. <laughs> <laughs> Is everyone very shy? Or? I think we have some over here. Oh, there we go. There we go. Okay. <laughs> Just wait for the mic. There. Uh, Michelle Creams from Wrangell. So I, my question is about students. And we see a wave of students coming out. And, and your chart shows that if they stick with creative industry jobs, they will make more than other people over mm -hmm. time. But the challenge is entry-level jobs in creative industry pay very little. And there's a crushing amount of student debt that, that many of these students are, are facing. What, what do you see as ways that the industry might be able to resolve some of these issues and help to um, bring more socioeconomic diversity into the design world as well um, get, so that people aren't graduating with that, those kind of loans? So the question uh, synoptically is um, with students having tremendous uh, debt as they come out of school, and the, the entry level jobs for the creative industries are low. What could be done by the industries to help the schools, in a sense, bridge the, that gap, that socioeconomic gap? Is that a fair synopsis? Better than I said it. <laughs> <laughs> you answer. Uh, me? <laughs> <laughs> you. It's a good I just paid my loans off yesterday. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, look, I think, you know, I think it's interesting. We were talking before as well. I think there's a, I agree, you know, entry level 
positions are challenging. Um, you know, we have internships and we have entry level programs, um, lots of contractors as well as, as staff. Um, I do believe that the opportunities are going to start to increase exponentially. I think maybe looking at it, if I were a student today coming out with the amount of debt um, that, that they're coming out with today, I think I would actually embrace the fact of maybe the traditional model of going into you know, a space or working for a company in one specific company um, is maybe not the model to be thinking about in the future. Distributed teams, um, lots of the technologies and tools. Uh, my kids, I, I, I don't know how they're, what they're gonna do. I don't believe that they'll actually ever go into an office space. What I'm getting at is that actually offers them an opportunity with technology, and again, going back to that, to work in multiple environments, most likely remotely. Um, so they may have, they may, my kids might work for three different companies at the same time. Now, I don't know if, if you know, the increased cost that's, that's excelling. I, I do believe that my personal view is I believe that companies, um, organizations uh, like ours and like others should actually invest more into um, helping creative people and creative thinkers, um, maturing them in ways that, because I think that when you come out of school, uh, it's challenging. What you're taught is not always the application that you need to kind of adapt to within an environment. So I think if there's more of that, I believe that, that companies themselves have a bit of a responsibility to help coach and, and train in those areas, working with institutions like Otis um, to help set that framework for success for people. I don't know if that fully answers your question. I don't know if there's a silver bullet. Um, it's excruciating. But I think the opportunities will outweigh that as we move forward. And I think that, again, um, students will have to look at it in different ways. I think there is a lot of opportunities if they look outside of their specific. And just from the point of view of the college, of Otis College, I think you know we have internships. We work with companies outside. We try to create platforms both within the curriculum and outside the curriculum, back and forth, in order to actually have the students um, move into that real life experience with entrepreneurship and so on yeah. in advance of, uh, of graduating. So there's, there's a back and forth iteration now uh, that did, probably didn't used to be as active and you know, it used to happen only after graduation, now it happens through the process of, of, the, of the education itself. Uh, and certainly corporations investing, uh, we have mentors who have other kinds of, of relationships to companies and corporations that actually invest in the students uh, at an earlier stage than they would have in the past. And obviously we encourage that within the, within the, the, per, the parameters of the responsibility of the education itself. Mm -hmm. Sir, they'll, they'll bring you a mic. Oh, oh, sorry. Oh, okay. I was interested in knowing what you mean by what's your definition of a design led company because it's almost self defining. Like all the things I saw briefly are relatively new companies that rely very yeah. much on tech. So, of course, those are some of the most successful companies we have now. So, what is a non design led company? I, I, the, que okay. the question is what is a non design led company? Company. I think um, so. The, the two examples that, that I put up there for non design, originally non design led companies that are moving in that direction are IBM and 3M. Um, you're seeing chief digital officers, chief experience officers, chief design officers start to emerge. Uh, IBM is a, is a great example that over really over the course of the last five plus years. Um, they developed that design framework, that design thinking framework, um, and are uh, actually emerging in a much more meaningful way. So their purpose is maybe not you know holistically or traditionally like an Airbnb, right, where it was founded by designers and creative people. But I do think you're looking at two different areas. To your point, there's new generation that's moving that way, um, and then there's companies that have been around for a while, like IBM or NBC, that are moving. And really understanding that creativity and design, um, that focus is helping them connect in this new sort of landscape. So in some ways, I mean, they're forced to do that. Um, but I think uh, as designers, those opportunities are emerging. 3M is doing some incredible innovative sort of work uh, from a design perspective. 
uh, and really championing the core values you're starting to see emerge. So that's, I think, what I mean when you're looking at that transformative sort of area with a 3M or an IBM where that, that culture is built. Uh, IBM is a great example, uh, to go back to the previous question, is, is recruit straight out of school. Um, brings people in and then train them in the methods and the, and the methodologies of design that they want them to be in because they're 380,000 people worldwide, right? A massive, I think, 120, 180 locations uh, throughout the globe. So they're invested in maturing that. They're invested and they're seeing the results and the value on the returns on moving the needle um, with the C-suite, right? So when you can start to show value and, and produce financial returns, I think you start to see the momentum kind of shift. So. It, they lost their way, um, you know. I think candidly, you would say that they moved away from it, and now they're having, that's why I mentioned a, a renaissance. Um, 3M wasn't, but is moving towards that direction. Um, you know, Airbnb, Uber, obviously a lot of the, the, the new ones are really design focused uh, from the beginning, and you can see, again, to your point, the trajectory of the valuations that they're producing uh, when they are focused on design first uh, approaches. So. You know, I think the numbers are starting to mature in a way that, that businesses, both new and old, are looking at what that value is and, and moving their uh, organizations in those directions if they're not starting at the core. The question is that you're using design in such a broad sense. Are there different aspects of design? There's visual design, there's component design. Is Yes. But I think at their core, they weren't considered designers. So I, I think again, I think there's a there's a shift in the approach of what that means uh, with human centered or human interaction, right? So I think there's always been that in a technology sort of area. When I was at Microsoft, I mean, it's a is a great example. It was an engineer led you know, engineer focused. And when I was there, it was a transformative or pivotal point where um, design and what they called the Metro movement, which is frankly just Swiss design, um, was the movement and the momentum to move them towards a customer facing, right? From, from design led, from engineering led to design led. And I think they've seen the benefits of that. So when I think of design, yes, I talk about very broad general terms because to your point, you can go in, there's product design, there's voice design, there's interaction design, there is physical design, there's graphic design, there's motion design, there's video design. Um, but when we look at that holistically, and I think design for me is emerging as that thread that is connecting all of those. So it's basically the big D comes up and then there's segments below. Are there other questions? Gentleman in the front, and then there's someone. Thank you for referring to me as a gentleman. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't realize it was you. Um, well, I think there's growing recognition about the importance of the creative economy. Like we mentioned, um, the Board of Supervisors unanimously approved the creation of an arts department to sustain and grow creativity um, in LA County to recognize its importance here. And I think whatever happens in LA really does spread to the rest of the state and drives policy um, at the state level. So we're going to see probably in the next few years something being done at the state level that's going to be really 
nurturing and sustaining the creative economy in our state. And in terms of if it's actually driving out um, creative economy jobs, I haven't seen that. Um, year over year, we've seen um, growth in the creative economy in the state. Uh, we recovered all the jobs we lost during the Great Recession. We've added more jobs, so we're now, you know, we have more jobs now than we did at the peak recession level. All right, so that's encouraging. I think what we have here is an ecosystem that encourages and grows the creative economy, um, not just at the Bay Area and the Silicon Valley, but also down here in the Silicon Beach. So in terms of those growth, I, we haven't seen anything um, in terms of driving it to other states. We have by far the largest uh, creative industry cluster here. Um, this gentleman here and then that lady. Okay, start there. Okay. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Sorry. Um, Colette Malene with Inner City Arts. Um, we, this report focuses on the larger picture of the creative economy. And the first question was about supporting entry level uh, jobs of students coming out of college. What can our existing creative organizations do to support students in elementary and high school to support this conversation and empower them to understand um, what goes into these types of jobs? Because right now there's this stigma. I know STEAM is it's out there, but most students are still focusing on your traditional jobs. Yeah. What can we do? in partnership with the companies, the creative companies, to support students in the conversation about these opportunities that are in front of them, and then educating them on where to find the information and supporting their college education or whatever track they choose so they don't come out with debt and there's not um, concern about living after they finish school. Right. So just to synopsize it, so the question is, so what can they, what can be done for students who are being educated in the school system prior to entry, even college, that would, would allow them to be um, encouraged to understand the possibilities in advance uh, of, of college and in advance of moving into the cultural sphere? Is that right? Okay. Either of you? Um, well, I think part of it is I mean, recognizing the importance at an earlier level, at the you know the K-12 level. I think we're seeing, like uh, Sean mentioned, there's a renaissance of recognition, um, and I think part of it is taking ownership from the from the company's perspective because you know we hear about knowledge gap or skills gap, and you know sometimes it seems like the companies are hands off on that in that conversation. So I think if companies get more involved at the school level and say, you know what, we need students to come out with X, Y, Z, and then really creating that partnership, um, I think that's important. Um, in terms of you know, just starting earlier, I think we are seeing more growth in that. And like you mentioned, his sons you know, may not even go into a traditional working environment because for them that's so alien. So, so I think we are seeing some rapid transformations. In, but just really having that conversation and that partnership, both uh, from the industry and uh, occupations, but also at the school level. So it's more of a partnership. Yeah. I think it's also necessary to make these kind of statistics and this kind of report and, and information available uh, to teachers and to, you know, to, to a wide variety of, of publics rather than just the cognitive time. Excuse me, I'll add to that as well. I think, you know, overall, there needs to be a greater investment in it. We've seen that retraction. Um, and whether that is, you know, a combination between, you know, the city of L.A. or California or school districts or, um, you know, whether it's, it's institutions or organizations and companies. You know, I think if we, if we truly want to see that, that grow and flourish in, in California, but L.A. specifically and, you know, in some of the... Some, some of the parts, parts of the city, city that I, I, I don't, don't believe get as much focus as they should have. Um, it, it, it takes a massive amount of investment. And it takes, honestly, a lot of people like myself and others. I do talks at some of these schools um, as a representative of NBC um, and really investing in these kids to understand that there is a, opportunities there that they may not be seen, right? So I'll give you a really brief example. Uh, we had a we were asked to go over to RFK High School right after one of the shootings. Um, and it was an arts program 
in the middle of you know just a sea of schools. I think there's like five to seven thousand school, uh, five to seven thousand kids in that entire complex. And this is a group of kids who basically you know the school is on lockdown. Um, most of them, or many of them, were bringing guns to school because they did, couldn't get home safely. But it was an arts program that, for these high school kids, didn't really know how to apply it. Their parents were telling them that there's really not much of a future in that. Like you should go into this or that. You should just get a real job. Similar to what I went through, to be honest. Um, yeah, I drove my parents crazy, so I kind of told them that they should do that. And I saw people's photography and Instagram and drawings, and I was like, whoa. Well, you know, you have a voice, you have an ability to do that. A lot of times what we need is we need investment in those kids at, at each one of those stages and ages with a level of creative leadership that is going to go out there and hopefully get funding and impact to have those types of programs, even if they're small. I think they're incredibly valuable. Um, I think the last piece of that is one of the things that we've been talking about internally at NBC is, you know, are there pilot programs to your point or incubators to where we can start at an earlier stage to inspire people and really see what the opportunities are, right? Um, beyond traditional methods, we've got people who want to be on set or do set design or do fashion design. They just don't know what that means. Um, and then we have photographers and people who want to get into film, but they're shooting Instagram stories all day long. Some of their stuff is better than half the people, you know, that work for me, right? Um, big, which is crazy. Um, so I think, I think if we invest, and, and I think it takes a, a concentrated amount of investment at all levels, um, but especially in the cities, and even I would say in the rural areas where I didn't have those types of opportunities, um, that's a really, I think the report to your point, hopefully that helps to bridge that to really see that the, the power and the investment into the creative culture and economy can, can grow exponentially. There's a ton of opportunities. Um, that we might not even see right now, that I can guarantee that the kids aren't seeing. So. I would just add one more point, which is that, you know, these are the kinds of questions you should ask the politicians that you vote for as well, because they form policy, and if they're educated in these terms, we've seen that it has an impact, but every politician that you, you know, that you, that you are behind or, or against, you should be asking the same questions of them, because this is a new, is a new economy that they haven't yet fully appreciated. I think at the federal government level, we're seeing the potential of actual destruction of loans, to go to your point about the, uh, with regard to student loans and so on. So we, we have to be actually very aware of what politicians believe about this, this part of the economy and this part of the culture. So that's a question that you have to ask uh, politicians as well and to, you know, to influence them as well, because finally they're policies influence all of us, and they're not as educated as, as our students are about these subjects, for instance, yeah. Yeah. in general. Somebody got the mic? There's a gentleman here. Sir, do you still have your hand up? No, here, here. Okay. No, this gentleman. Michael D. McCarty, storyteller, have mouth, do right. Um, my question is about the role of libraries in the, uh, the tech world. With more and more schools not having arts programs for many children, their first, if not most dominant, exposure to arts is in the library system. And I know, as I work in libraries, a lot of them are emphasizing STEAM, Hopefully more will start recognizing, well, I said, I said that backwards. You know that. <laughs> so the question is about libraries, because libraries are still the traditional way that most students uh, gain information or are introduced to the arts. Um, I'm not sure that I'm qualified to answer the question. Sue, do you want to answer the question? <laughs> Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's it's, it's a, a really good, good point, point, and I, I actually don't have an answer to it. I have an idea, but not an answer. <laughs> idea is good. <laughs> uh, okay, well, I'll throw it out there. Um, you know, I think it, it dovetails, I think, on some of the previous questions as well. I think 
lambasting or not trying to lambast, I think, Silicon Valley, but, but you know, all the, the companies and the money that's there, right, to, to garner a billion dollar valuation if an incremental amount of that was put into these types of things and these types of programs, um, and even pilots for kids, you know, I think that could be meaningful. There's a, as we've seen, I mean, there's a huge amount of money that's flowing through California when you look at, you know, from the top of the state to the, to, to the bottom of the state and everywhere in between, you know, and maybe that's a, you know, a new approach. And again, I think politicians and, and, and uh, you know, other areas, um, private investment, things like that, if, if I think if, if that culture and the, and the reports and things like that, you get that momentum, you know, my hope would be that people would invest in that, understanding that's more powerful uh, and, and beneficial, beneficial for their needs as a whole. Um, it's a great recruiting method too, you know. So. A couple of hands over there. Thank you. Hi, I'm Diane from Ryman Arts. We work with teenage artists, so I'm thinking very much about what are the next steps for each of you uh, with this report. Bruce, you mentioned we should all be talking to our politicians, elected officials, and. How can, you know, what are each of your plans? How does this report get to those people? I think most of us probably believe um, and know from our work experience and our personal experience the importance of the creative economy. But how do we get that to others? In my own case, I think about the students that we work with who are passionate about being makers and artists, um, but their parents um, may not be, as you have described, oops, and uh, their schools may not be so supportive of uh, that path and may not think that creative young people need to go to college and have the same high standards that their peers do who are more academic, traditionally academically oriented. We did an experience recently where students went behind the scenes at a creative business and we let some parents join in. And that was profound actually, that was probably more important than the students' experience as parents you know, got confident about asking, so how much money do people make here? and realizing that these are jobs they should encourage their kids right, right. But how can this report and how will each of you take this to some next step? How can we together be moving it forward in real practical you know, strategies here? I'm eager to you know, get that word out to the people who are not in this room. So the, the question is how do we get this report to have greater visibility and therefore greater influence? And, just so one thing that we do with the report, there are many things that we do with it, but one thing is we take it to Sacramento. Ben Allen, who is our senator, you know, is on the Arts Committee, and, and he is a strong advocate for the arts. His mother was, I think, the head of the Santa Monica Arts Commission at some point, and so Ben brings it forward to other elected officials in Sacramento, and the first time I took it up there, um, you know, there was a certain kind of resistance to it. By the second time we took it up there, uh, politicians were asking to have lunch and hear more about it. So, you know, it, it slowly does have that kind of impact that's both direct and indirect. Um, but certainly, we, we, you know, we'd like to give this report to as many people that want it. And we know it's used as a model for, by other cities in, in North America and elsewhere and so on. So we just try to spread it as broadly as possible. That's sort of our role but you might want to speak to other roles. Sure, uh, part of my role is you know, continuing the research and analysis of the creative economy, uh, just recognizing the importance of it um, in terms of the economy as a whole. 50% uh, of people in the creative economy, the jobs require at least a bachelor's degree, and for us, that's, there's a wage premium of the, for that. You, know, you, you, you earn significantly more the higher education level is, and really that has a multiplier effect on our economy as a whole, so in terms of encouraging that, you know, uh, like I think I mentioned, um, our economy is pretty uh, robust and healthy right now. You know, pretty much everybody who has a wants a job has a job. Now it's, we want to encourage them to have the right types of jobs, the jobs that are really going to move them forward, to support them, support their families, and really make a significant contribution to our economy. And I think the creative economy jobs really have really the most bang for their bucks. So it's just in terms of keeping the research going, keeping the analysis going, and keeping the creative economy numbers you know, as fresh and as sustainable so you know, we can use it to support public policy measures. I'll speak to the parents that come to Ryan. I think there's a mic right there. Just an observation. 
court could look at some of the social impact of what happened when the creative economy really picks up and it's burgeoning like it is in a state um, because it begins to uh, create some kind of class divisions. Um, and we see this in Los Angeles where um, when you look at the different um, uh, economic brackets and different uh, job levels um, in a city like Los Angeles, there are uh, different wealth dis distributions. Um, people move into different communities. People are displaced as a result, and we're, we're seeing that here. And I'm wondering what kind of, um, uh, you know, there is a sort of disruptor uh, element to the creative economy as wealth comes into community, and you see areas like the arts district, which was once supposed to be a kind of uh, one thing with mixed use, artists and creatives living there with uh, different economies, now becoming more of a consumer destination, um, uh, communities of color in, the, uh, in that region now being displaced with some great tension. Now, this has a lot to do with the creative the economy being successful on one level, as we're seeing, and that's a good thing, but it's also having a social impact. And so I'd be interested to see the report sort of start to broaden itself, not just about job and job creation, but also about the kind of demographic and social impact, um, you know, going forward. And this has been, you know, uh, written about uh, by people like Richard Florida, location, stuff like that. But I think it would be something good for, uh, you know, maybe the report to take a look about, look at in terms of California, especially in, in Los Angeles with, So there wasn't a question, but the, the speaker was talking about the it was a recommendation to the report to deal with the kinds of social displacements that occur with the success of the creative economy, particularly in Los Angeles, but throughout California, and the way in which the, the, the success of the creative economy is creating uh, social displacements and, and, uh, and a new class system, in a sense. Uh, so that it was a recommendation to the report for next year, I assume. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Do you want to yeah, speak to that? Um, no, no. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on those two last points. I think one of the great things about the Human Center Design is that it allows a map or a framework um, in which to approach a project with really empathy at the core and relationship building and coalition building. And so when we think about how we can take like this framework into the social, I see a lot of opportunity presenting itself like at the very local level, like in our neighborhood councils, really connecting to the people who can make policy change in our direct communities because the problems um, to me, they seem so vast. It's, it's really hard to kind of grapple with how much needs to be changed. But with creative thinking and coalition building and diverse um, populations coming together, where, whether, whether it's the educators with local nonprofits and community um, members joining forces at the neighborhood level with Policymakers, I see that as an avenue um, or a vehicle to change. And something like human centered design being brought into these environments as a, a way in. Because yeah. I think that human centered design does provide that framework, but it also leaves this great potential for openness because it's not prescriptive. Um, so, yeah, how do you see that potentially being like an avenue forward through business, education, and, and the political and social level? Uh, I'm not sure I can synopsize it, but um, I think the, the question is how, how do you use human-centered design at a community and neighborhood level that would be more effective perhaps than these larger kinds of vast... Uh, Right. industry and business to more of like using it as a roadmap, 
a social political level. Right. How to, how to use it as a roadmap for social political uh, movement or, or change at a, at a more local level. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, I, I, I think you're absolutely correct on, on that approach. Um, you know, the challenge is always implementing those, right? But I think, I think what you're touching on is, is, is the framework exists as a more broad framework, right? On how to understand different perspectives, bring the right people into the room, and, uh, you know, establish a framework or a, or a set of principles or practice that you are ultimately trying to come to a conclusion on. And that, that conclusion with, with that process, with HCI and design thinking, you know, is effectively the outcome may not be the outcome that, that we think it is. And, and through that working process, figuring out what works, and it always comes down, everybody always looks at the money part of it. And look, I mean, if, you know, if anybody could wave a, wave a wand and get funded however they want to be funded, wouldn't that be fantastic? But that's not reality. And I think what you're touching on is is the framework, whether it's with, you know, local communities and politicians and, um, you know, whether that's companies and, and, and people and even going back and talking to parents, frankly, and bringing them in, showing them the value of working through that process, um, I think is incredibly powerful and unique. Um, you know, I'll, I'll be frank, I, both of my boys' schools, they are, again, LAUST, they, they hate when I'm coming because I'm going to go through and I'm going to try to kind of refine a process that, that I know is evolving. Um, and it's challenging. It's a, it's a, when you've got a lot of people who think in a certain way and understanding the value of thinking in a, in a different perspective and, and shifting that mindset um, is truly at its core. So I think those practices and principles can be applied to everyday living, can be applied to your, your local areas and how you want to kind of infuse that creativity um, storytelling, imagination uh, into your everyday sort of practice in life. So that might be a small center. It might just be a group that's, that's able to get together. There's not a lot that needs to be done. Um, you know, kids are pretty resourceful and resilient, you know. And there wasn't, it wasn't too long ago that, you know, parents throw you a box of sticks and you figured it out. I mean, that was at its core, right? Design thinking. It's like before all the technology I showed, I mean, you know, that's it. Its core premise is putting people together and, and making something different happen and having um, a different approach and understanding and having empathy throughout, throughout that uh, process. So. It's. Yeah. Like, yeah. You set up, you set, you start with the premise that you're going to fail. Absolutely. You get used to it. And then we're going to go from there. We're going to see how, what we can learn from that failure. And so I feel like that takes away the fear of people coming together and addressing an issue in, from a lot of different perspectives in a lot of very different ways. Because already, you know, okay, I don't have to be embarrassed. I don't have to yeah. be Yeah. Are there, are there other questions in the room? Um, one thing I was going to say to your question, Clayton, we'll take that recommendation seriously. Last year we did, in the report, have information about live workspaces for artists and designers and so on. We've tried to, you know, each report has, has some kind of addendum and some kind of information like that, but the report can't do all things, you know, so it, but it's a, it's a recommendation we'll take seriously to think about for next year. Uh, other, other, other questions? questions? Sorry. Hi, um, my name is Scott Beckin. I'm a filmmaker and an educator. And I'm very fortunate to be able to work with my craft and make a living off of it. I'm also very fortunate to belong to very two, two very strong unions, Directors Guild and the American Federation of Teachers. So my question is, the creative economy is moving towards a independent contractor model. A lot of companies are using that, where the workers have no protections whatsoever. So what can we do to, to help 
creative workers get things like benefits. So, I mean, it's a big question, obviously, and it's a, it's a political question. Um, you know, it, I, I don't have an immediate answer to that at all, but I, I think that you're, you know, you're touching on the point that the other person touched on earlier, which has to do with the low entry level, and that there's so many independents that, you know, people are, are starting to suggest that some of these large corporations are, are using it as sort of a low uh, labor force, and, and you know, and uh, and there are no rights, and their no, rights are not built in, and so on. It, it seems to me that that's more of a political question than a, an economic question, but uh, unionization has been traditionally the way of dealing with that issue. But the question I think today is whether unionization can deal with that issue when there's so much fluidity and mobility in that workforce. Um, so I don't have an answer. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you have two unions that strongly represent you. I've questioned that same thing for years. So, but designers, yeah, of course. Thank you. <laughs> do you have your card? Do you have your card with you? <laughs> I think a lot of people want to talk to you. <laughs> We can definitely include that. We haven't yet because for us it's job counts, you know, how many jobs regardless of who you are. But, you know, in an area as diverse as LA County, I think there is an opportunity to um, expand our report and include some of those statistics to the extent that it's available. Some of it is, you know, kind of limited. Uh, you know, so there's it's a way to maybe identify opportunities for people of color, women, um, any other demographic breakdown that we can find um, to see what are the opportunities. I think. Um, that, that might be something, something we want to, you know, like you said, in every year we want to make the report better and bigger and better, so that might be a great way to add some um, color to the report. <laughs> so we're just, we're just going to do one more question. So this, young, this person over here, maybe. Thanks. Hi, my name is Michelle, and I work at a local university as well. And um, I, piggybacking on that previous question around diversity, you talk about diverse inclusion thinking being a core principle of um, design thinking. And so, um, wondering what, from industry, from institutions, um, at a city level, what's being encouraged to promote diversity within the arts? Um, I know. Anecdotally, from even our university, it seems like there is underrepresentation. Um, so, yeah, just curious to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, yeah. Well, certainly here we have a, 
extraordinarily diverse student body. It's, it's in the top one percentile of the nation, and we have a very diverse staff, uh, and we have you know, a commitment to diversifying the faculty. So it's, it's part of our ethos and part of our culture, and I think, uh, it's, I, th I think as Sean said so eloquently earlier, it's not just a kind of principle that uh, is of you know, good practice and good philosophy and, and political correctness, but it's actually good business. I mean, it's, it's, it's a way in which the culture uh, thrives and uh, everything we can do to continue to make it a more robust culture uh, we're committed to, I think, you know, in every way. And it's in the curriculum. It's, you know, we're, it drives certain changes in the curriculum and so on to really sort of in some way echo or be a mirror of the culture that we serve. Um, I'll, look, I'll add to, uh, it's, it's challenging, challenging right now. now. I mean, I think, you know, to, to your point, Otis does a great job. A lot of institutions will, will do a great job. I don't know that a lot of companies are doing a great job. I mean, that is fact. Um, with women, women of color, um, you know, people of color in general, the diversity factor is not where it should be. Um, I do think that, you know, when, when I look at it from a practice of design thinking, that's part of, I think, the mentality that's starting to shift. Um, how do I say it nicely? Like if, if, if a company, there's a lot of companies that are out there. If, if, you, if you don't have diversity in your company, you're probably just not a good company. And you shouldn't necessarily, this is my personal take, you shouldn't need a chief di uh, diversity officer. That's kind of a red flag. Um, that you haven't done what you needed to do from the beginning. Now, I will say that, you know, my, my teams, and I think NBC and NBC Universal is actually incredibly diverse, surprisingly diverse across the board. Um, there's a, a pretty significant dynamic of, of people of all ages, colors, genders, religions, nationalities, uh, uh, disabilities um, that were, were within the organization at very high levels and, and low levels as well. Uh, that's, that's, not every, that's not every picture that you see. Um, and again, I go back to the fact that I think, I think, as, new, I think as new generations of leadership are coming through, and um, I think you're going to see that shift that's already naturally starting to happen, but it's still incredibly small. I mean, women in creative and advertising in a whole, I think, is at 3%. I mean, it's an abysmal number. And then if you go into women of color within that, you're even smaller, you're a fraction of that percent. So, so I think there's a lot of things that need to happen to, to move that forward. And I think we're not, we're not maximizing our, our, our true approach and how we're looking and, and moving towards the world. Um, so. so I want to thank everybody for coming this morning. You can obviously ask questions afterwards of any of us, and you can get uh, your business card. Uh, <laughs> thank you, everyone. No, that was a good answer.